Well, thank you for joining me on Good Friday as we reflect on another psalm together. Good Friday is a moment where we as Christians reflect on what Jesus did for us on the cross. And the cross event, that is Jesus' death and his resurrection, forms a central moment in human history. Before Jesus' death, everything was building up to that moment. And the moment of Jesus' death is a crescendo as God steps in to rescue mankind from the separation that we knew from God. And everything after Jesus' resurrection has been built on the foundation of the knowledge of the fact that Jesus is alive. The cross event is central. You know the word crucial? It comes from the word cross. And the cross is, is the crucial event in human history. Why? Well, I've said it already. Look, It's the moment where God steps in so that man is no longer separated from God forever. You know, when God created Adam and Eve, they walked with God, with, with God in the garden in clear community with him. But their sin separated them from him. God had to banish them from his presence. And because of the cross, you and I can know relationship with God again. It's because of Jesus' work on our behalf that we can know uh, a, com- a community with God, a relationship with him. The gospel writers, when they write about the account of the crucifixion, uh, point towards a psalm as they do that. And they point towards Psalm 22. I've spoken about this before, but some psalms fulfill a praise function. They are worship and adoration to God to say, God, you are so good. You are so great. And other psalms form a function of lament. And lament is where is, is a heartfelt cry to God out of, out of a downcast nature. You know, when you're down and you feel downtrodden and you feel in anguish, you can lament before God. God, I feel like this. I feel sorrowful. But God, I know you're good, but I feel like this. That's a lament. And you see them many times in the Psalms. And yet there is a third function for some of the Psalms. You see, some of the Psalms are prophetic. And the gospel writers in writing the account of Jesus' crucifixion all point towards Psalm 22. Matthew, Mark and John all point to it explicitly. They say that what is happening is fulfilling Psalm 22. And Luke points to it implicitly. And then what he says it has correlation to what the psalm says. So, for example, he talks about casting lots for Jesus' clothes. And, and he, he says uh, that Jesus' words on the cross of Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You know, that correlates a lot with what you'll read in verse 8 of Psalm 22. So either explicitly or implicitly, these gospel writers write about this psalm. Why are they doing that? Well, look, the, the Jewish people knew this psalm was about the Messiah who was to come. The one who would be scorned and rejected by men, the one who was despised, the one who uh, who was rejected to the point of death. Who's, it says in Psalm 22 that, that his body is left in the dust of death and that his hands and feet are pierced. The gospel writers are keen to point to this psalm because it is a psalm pointing towards the Messiah. And they say, look, here's the Messiah. Here he is. It's Jesus. He's not just another man dying on a crucifix, but he is the son of God dying on the cross. Jesus himself points to this psalm. Matthew and Mark both point to Jesus' words on the cross being, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is the first verse of Psalm 22. Jesus is saying this from the cross and it's been known in history as the cry of dereliction from the cross. You know, we used to sing a song, How Great the Father's Love for Us. And in that song, there's, I think, quite an unhelpful line of the father turns his face away. Almost kind of saying that God just walked away from Jesus and left him there on the cross to suffer and die. I don't actually think that that actually reflects what Jesus is saying. as He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think there is the very real truth that on the cross, Jesus is experiencing the punishment that we deserve for our sin. You know, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians that Jesus takes on our sin. He knows our sin. The one who knew no sin knows sin that we might become the righteousness of God. You know, so on the cross, Jesus is fulfilling the function of being our substitute, being our sacrifice, taking our place, taking our sin upon himself. You know, the consequence for sin is separation. We see that in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve's sin leads to their separation from God. And so on the cross, there is the very real knowledge that Jesus is separate from God. But is God turning his face away? Does that what the gospel say? No, it's not. 
Does God forsake Jesus on the cross? No, because to forsake means to abandon, means to give up on. God does not abandon Jesus. Jesus is also fulfilling something else when he's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, Jesus is pointing to Psalm 22, just like the gospel writers are. And why is he so keen to point to this psalm? Well, look, he's saying, look, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one who is dying for the sins of the world. But he's also saying something else. You see, in the moment of this sorrow, in the moment of this anguish, there is joy and there is victory. Why am I saying that? Well, look, Psalm 22 starts as a lament, but it ends in praise and worship to God. There's an amazing part of this psalm. You see, there aren't that many psalms like this psalm because the, the whole first half of it is a lament. It's uh, being, you know, I, I, why have you rejected me? I'm being downtrodden. I'm being pushed into the ground. My hands and feet are pierced. I, I'm laid to the dust of, uh, of the earth. It's a song of lament. But by the end of it, it's a song of victory. The one who has been pushed down into the ground is raised up, is raised victorious. Let me just read you what it says at the end of Psalm 22, verse 27. All of the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. You see, the one who is afflicted and downtrodden and rejected by men is raised up, is glorified and all of the nations turn to him. Jesus, as he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is pointing us to the fact that he is going to be victorious over death and over sin. You know, John says in, in, in John 19, 30, there's this interesting thing you see in the, in the gospel writers. So I'm going to go back for one second. You know, Matthew and Mark say that, that Jesus says from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then they say, and he gave out a loud cry and breathed his last. John tells us what Jesus's last cry was. John 19, verse 30. It says this, Jesus cried out, it is finished. What is finished? What is finished? Well, I think Jesus is pointing somewhere else there. So he points to Psalm 22 when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But when he says it is finished, he's pointing to Daniel 9. And Daniel 9 says this, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. You know, that is the work of Jesus on the cross. Jesus finishes the transgression. Jesus finishes sin. He puts an end to sin on the cross. He brings in everlasting righteousness and atones for iniquity that we might know God, that we might have relationship with him. He comes in as our substitute. You see, Good Friday is a day when we can be sorrowful and remember what Jesus walked through for us. But even in the sorrow, there was the, 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 the seed of victory. Even in the anguish, there was the hope of, of life over death. Jesus on the cross is winning a victory on our behalf. Wow, what an amazing story. Jesus dies for us. But as he dies, he is winning the greatest victory over the greatest battle. Sin itself is being defeated. Death itself is being defeated as Jesus breathes out his last. It is finished. And you know what happened at that point? The temple curtain was torn in two. Man, all of a sudden, was able to enter into a relationship with God. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can know life. Psalm 22. It speaks of the one who came and suffered and died and is glorified to life. You know what? Today, let's just come to God in worship, in praise, in adoration, thanking him for all that he's done for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you came on the cross. Lord, that you died in our place, that, you, that where we were separated from God, Jesus, you made a way for us to know communion and relationship with him. Lord, I thank you that because of what you've done, where we all we were going to know was separation from God for eternity. Jesus, I thank you because of what you've done. We can know life and hope. And so, Lord, I pray this Good Friday as people are at home, maybe feeling isolated, maybe feeling separated. Lord, I thank you that by your spirit, we can know community and communion with you. And so, Lord, I pray that on this Good Friday, Lord, that we would know your love. We would know your peace and we would know the power of your death and resurrection in our lives. Amen. Well, that's it for me today. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday.